Hi, y'all. My name's Cheryl. I am with the Williamson County Regional Animal Shelter. I'm the shelter director. And it's good to see you guys here. Um, so we have been saving, we have been over 90% save rate in an open admission shelter since December of 2010. Um, and that doesn't just count dogs and cats that we euthanize, that also counts dogs and cats that we lose for whatever reason, like puppies or kittens that we uh, bottle feed and don't make it and that kind of thing. So we count actually all of our statistics, owners, surrenders that uh, request euthanasia, we count everything in, this, in our save rate. So I'm happy to talk to you a little bit about how we do that because we're a little bit different than Austin in the fact that we don't have an APA in our county um, to help us pull animals out of there. And um, we don't have a government mandate to do uh, no kill. We do it because um, we think it's the right thing to do. So um, that's our euthanasia stats only. Um, so you can see how over in the last uh, years we've um, worked really hard to decrease what we euthanize. Um, I am actually, I've been the shelter director there since uh, September 11th, 2007, six months after the shelter opened, I started there. Uh, prior to that, I was, um, I was an EMS, I was a paramedic uh, ER nurse for uh, 32 years and decided I liked animals better. <laughs> they actually, not, not, it, it's not that I never liked people, it's just that they seemed to have more of a need that somebody needed to help them step in and help. And so uh, I was an EMS director in a city, um, and so I was department head. And so uh, with some things going on in our own shelter there, about 10 years after I was there, I decided the shelter needed a lot of help. Um, they euthanized everything that came into that small shelter. There was lots of disease and that kind of thing in there. I just had an opportunity to go out there every once in a while with the police lieutenant who was over the shelter. And so myself and another lady formed a volunteer group called Cause for Paws, and we started volunteering at the shelter and got some, some people within the town to start volunteering. And about six months after doing that, um, against a lot of the, police, the police's uh, wishes, we, uh, I got the city council to give me um, the shelter and animal control under my department, which was under EMS, so, or with EMS, it went under EMS. But anyway, so, so then I spent about 10 years in that city before I retired doing EMS and animal services. And so I decided to let EMS go <laughs> and just concentrate on animals. So that's my background. Um, so no-kill is not easy. It's, it's certainly not the easy way to do things, um, but it, we do it because it's right. Um, and because those animals don't have anybody to speak up for them, we need to speak up for them, and so we need to be their guardians um, because their lives are literally in our hands. And one of the things I say a lot of times to people is, um, you know, you always hear, uh, well, the public's irresponsible, um, they keep bringing us animals, we don't have any room, it's their fault, we can't get, but the, the point is, is that those animals get to your animal shelter and um, it's up to you how they get out of the animal shelter. It's not up to the public, it's up to you. You make that decision on their life. So I take that very seriously. Um, and so every uh, animal has a chance in our shelter. Um, so a little bit about Williamson County. Williamson County is actually adjacent to Travis County. Um, so we cover like the cities of Round Rock, Cedar Park, um, all those cities in Williamson County. We actually cover all of Williamson County except for the cities of Georgetown and Taylor who have their own small city shelters. Um, we have had, we have a huge population increase every year. We're one of the fastest growing counties in the state of Texas. Um, and so that's a big challenge to us. Um, between 2000 and 2010, our population increased by 69.1%. And in the last three years, it's increased by 11%. So we are a mixture of urban and rural. We have um, a lot of urban areas on the western side of the county and a lot of rural on the eastern side of county. So that, that poses a lot of issues sometimes because um, I actually grew up on a farm in Williamson County. My dad still has our farm, our family farm. So I know that aspect of how um, farmers and ranchers think about dogs and cats and that kind of thing. And then I also know how I feel about them, which I'm not sure how I got to that point growing up on a farm, but I know how I feel about them. 
And so you have that mixture of that and that culture in our county. Um, Williamson County is not Austin. It is ultra, and I, they're capital letters for a reason, conservative. Um, and um, it is located just, on the, just north of Travis County. So that presents us some challenges um, and also some good things because people always hear in the news, all, all the Austin stations cover Williamson County. We don't have our own news stations. So um, they always hear, you know, Austin's no kill, no kill, no kill. So they expect that out of us. So that helps us with the public as well. So just to get an idea of who's in here, how many people in here work in shelters? How many are shelter directors? Good. And how many are volunteers? Good. And how many are animal advocates? Oh, come on, everybody has to raise their hand on that. <laughs> um, who'd I leave out? Board members, I have a board member sitting somewhere, I think she's here. Yep, there she is. Yep, good. So our shelter opened March of 2007. Uh, prior to that, each of the cities basically had their own shelter or contracted with the Humane Society of Williamson County um, for service. And then all the cities, with the exception of the two I mentioned, got together uh, with the county. There's uh, five of us in our, uh, in our collaborative effort. So we all uh, equally, they equal, each, each have a, has an equal seat on the governing board and they make all the decisions and each has an equal say no matter how many animals come in from each jurisdiction. So even though we are a um, county agency, we are paid by the county and uh, abide by county policies, all of our uh, animal sheltering policies um, and other decisions are made by our board. Our, our budgets approved by our board, our uh, policy manuals approved by our board. So it's kind of a kind of have two bosses basically, um, but it has worked out very well. Um, we have 24 employees, and we bring in about 6,500 animals now a year. We it used to be a lot more, but we've worked on that. So a little bit about statistics. Um, statistics are extremely important, but I also uh, believe in being very transparent. I don't hide anything. Um, we count every death, regardless of how it happens, as a uh, not a live outcome. And so uh, we don't do a whole lot of owner surrender euthanasias, but if we get those, we count those, um, even though it's can't help that, they needed to be that way, you know, so, but it still needs to be counted in your live save rate. Um, the one thing I find about statistics across the board is people tend to um, either hide things or they, they use different methods. And so what I would say to you about the methods is, um, is if you're comparing to other places within your uh, area of service, uh, let's say us in Travis County, is what I did is I called Aust the city of Austin and said, okay, how do you uh, figure out your live save rate? So we're doing apples, we're, we're talking about apples to apples and not, okay, well, I'm figuring on intake and they're figuring on outcome, basically. However, I did find, because um, I do it both ways, I report both ways. So I figure our outcomes on intake, based on intake, and I do it uh, based on outcome. So uh, I, over a year's period of time, there is such a minute difference in those two statistics that it doesn't make a difference. So it, it makes a difference probably for that month, but not over a period of time. But um, so your st statistics need to be factual, um, and I think they should be published. I think the public should know what you do um, and how you do it. And so you can use your statistics in a lot of way. You can use them to problem, problem solve. So let's say. Um, you know, one month this happened, and so you're gonna you, you're gonna put out a plea for fosters. You know that from April to November you're gonna be bombarded with kittens, so you you pump up your foster program. So you can use your statistics um, to to figure out what you need to do for the future. So develop programs, strategic plans. You need great statistics to get grants, and grants are not that hard to get. Um, but you need good numbers and you need to be able to report accurately. Um, and so we post all of our stats on our website in the form of an annual report each year. So our total intake of cat and dogs, um, it fluctuates per year, but you can see the last couple of years it's gone down and there's a reason for that, which I'll talk about in a little bit. 
Um, but that's about how many cats and dogs we take in. And of course, we take in rabbits and uh, guinea pigs. We got a kangaroo once. We've had big, huge albino snakes and you know, all kinds of things. So you, know, you always have those extra things. But we basically report in cats and dogs. And our dog intake, um, you can see we get them in as strays, owner surrenders, um, the ones that were born in the shelter. Um, the ones that are transferred in are basically animals sometimes that show, that we have adopted out that show up in other shelters. We take them back, um, or we used to. We have, we have pretty much stopped doing that. Um, but if our shelter is empty for some reason, which is rare, sometimes I help other shelters and bring some animals in which is sometimes that would be the transfer in. That, that happens very rarely. Um, and then animal control obviously brings us animals. So we have five animal control agencies that bring us animals, but we are not responsible for their activities. Each one is under their own uh, city or county under the police agencies. And cats also um, have decreased, and you can see how animal control in both of these, cats and dogs, have decreased over the last couple years. And again, there's a reason for that. So dog outcomes, um, you can see how much our adoptions and uh, things have changed. Our reclaims basically stay about the same. We usually have about 25% uh, reclaims through the shelter itself once they're there. Um, and we transfer some animals out, not a whole bunch. Um, we do have animals that die in the shelter, um, usually uh, either of uh, injuries that they sustained and they died after they get to the shelter, or uh, sometimes they die during surgery. We do our own surgeries in our shelter. Um, and then you can see what our euthanasia went from 2007 to um, last year. Cat outcome, basically about the same. Um, our animal control intake through cats has dramatically dropped, um, and our overall intake with cats has dropped as well. So one of the most important things um, that will make your shelter or break your shelter is people. Um, people in the form of your staff, uh, volunteers and fosters, um, donors, adopters, supporters, and customers. So all of these are equally important. Um, you never know when somebody that is uh, coming in for whatever reason might be a big donor in the future. Um, certainly if you treat them with kindness, uh, they're probably more likely to be a donor. Um, have you ever heard uh, customer service doggy style and not cat style? <laughs> you know, doggies are all friendly and happy and waggy for the most part, and cats are like kind of aloof. So you want to uh, do doggy style customer service. Um, so staff, um, this is our staff um, now, and it certainly didn't start out like that, but um, we've worked our way into getting more staff. Um, and we have different ways of paying for staff, even though most of them are county employees. Uh, but for instance, our offsite adoption counselor, I thought was a very important uh, person to have on staff. We tried it with volunteers. We have some volunteers that can do some offsite, but it's pretty limited. And so I figured staff, a staff person that would do it, it would uh, be consistent. They would always go to the same place. They could drive our van, which volunteers cannot because of county policy. And so um, we actually pay for that staff person out of donation money. And so it's an employee, but they get, I transfer donation money over. But all the money that she collects on site through adoption fees and uh, donations at site and what PetSmart pays us goes back into the donation fund. And I keep records every week of what she gets paid, uh, what she collects on site, how many dogs are adopted, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and then what she gets paid through payroll. And right now it's even, There's, it's a flush. So uh, if I can prove that, we'll probably get more positions in the future. But um, so an ACS is animal care specialists. Those are our kennel uh, techs, basically. Um, animal health technicians are vet techs. Um, and we have a surgical technician. And I actually have staff in here, and right there, three of them. So that's three of my staff. Um, staff was not on board with No Kill when I first started. So a lot of them were either animal control uh, personnel that had 
uh, transferred over to the shelter and were working at the shelter, or they were um, people that had been in animal services and worked in shelters for a long period of time. And in fact, animal control was my biggest ne nemesis when I said we would be no-kill. They were like, you cannot do it. They, and they were pretty ugly about it. So that, that was my biggest uh, hurdle, I think, was, was animal control. And, um, and they did some pretty dirty things, um, but we made it. And, and they're all believers now because they see it. So. But you've got to have staff that stands behind you. Uh, one of the biggest uh, increases in our no-kill rate was when a kennel manager that I originally had, she's a great person, but her idea of what's adoptable and my idea of what's adoptable was totally different. And in fact, uh, she is a, she's a shelter director uh, up north, and she posted one time uh, on Facebook they had a 100% save rate in her shelter. And I said, mm, I just texted her privately, and I said, how did you do that? Because you're open in mission. I mean, I'd love to have 100%, but you're always going to have the ones that don't survive, or you're going to always have the ones that are too dangerous to put in the community. And uh, she goes, well, that's of our adoptable. I said, so what was, your, what was your real rate? Well, they saved 78%. So it's all in about how you say it. You know, you can get a lot of community support by saying you're 100%, but you better watch what you're really reporting. So it's just, um, it's really important. Staff is super important. This is some of my staff. We do get uh, iguanas or whatever that is. I don't know. <laughs> and some more of my staff. And, yeah, that was a really great picture because he walked the rooster. <laughs> He's not there any longer, but he did walk the rooster. So we have policies that, um, that help us stay no-kill, and one is no animal ever has a time limit, ever. There's no time limit. They can be there for six months. Uh, rarely are they longer than a year. We've had a couple that uh, one dog made it over a year, and now he's in a happy home. Um, dogs with behavior issues are worked with. Um, we have cats that are not suitable for house pets. They're sent out as barn cats or shed cats or, work, you know, uh, workshop cats. Um, and when we do decide to euthanize an animal, we discuss each and every animal that, each and every euthanasia decision that we make. Um, and that used to, I would stay out of that. And that has also changed the euthanasia list a lot, which we don't have a euthanasia list, by the way. We never make one. Um, but we um, used to it was just the kennel manager that did that, and now it's a, it's a, we talk to staff, we talk to volunteers, uh, it's between me and the kennel manager and the vet techs. Um, obviously, if they're ill, it's a very limited discussion um, if we can't save them. And uh, it, our biggest discussions are on our behavior, animals, dogs in particular. So our number one euthanasia uh, reason in dogs is still behavior, and our number one euthanasia reason in cats is medical. We do treat everything. We always try to treat first. Uh, I think our biggest challenge in cats are those uh, declawed, owner-surrendered 10-year-olds that just don't do well in shelters. And, uh, you know, sometimes we just don't have foster homes for them, and they uh, go downhill. So this is our checklist. If anybody wants that, I have cards up here with my email address. You're welcome to email me for that. But we go through that checklist. And that's also a good check and balance because what I never want to happen is uh, us euthanize an animal that wasn't supposed to be euthanized. And when we were doing more euthanasias, that was always a big fear is that what if you pulled the wrong animal? What if they had a hold on them for some reason? So now they have to go through the computer and make sure that uh, they've they've finish their hold period, their required hold period, stray hold or whatever it is. If they were owners released, did we have an uh, executed document? Um, is the no euthanasia box ticked? If it's ticked and it says no euthanasia, I'm the only one who can override that. Um, and does the animal have a microchip or other ID and did we follow up thoroughly on that? Um, is there any other notes in the animal's data file concerning special holds or interested potential adopters? Did the, the finder say if I, I would be interested in adopting? Did the owner say if you're going to euthanize, I'll come back and get it? Um, so we, 
call all those people first and um, does the animal match any lost animal report. And then we, we put the reason down we're going to euthanize. If they're sick or injured, was veterinarian care provided? And if they, were, uh, if they were sick, was treatment provided? What treatment was provided and for how long? And if its behavior has all other uh, choice, uh, other options to rescue, rehabilitate, or foster been exhausted? And then two people have to sign that form. That form stays with every euthanasia that we do. We're actually audited by the county, and they actually audit these forms. So when we look at different programs, we look at two things. Is it going to decrease our intake, and is it going to increase our outcome? And if the program isn't going to do one of those two things, then we don't spend the money on it. So our money goes towards things that will help us bring less animals to the shelter and get, get more animals out. So uh, spay-neuter efforts. Um, we do those, and we support TNR, and we uh, increase our RTOs in the field by uh, talking with the animal control agencies. And actually, the pressure comes from the board member from that city or the county mandates that they try to get the animals back home before they get to us. And that explains, in the last two years, this is when we really started pushing this, the decrease in animal control intake. They have really uh, worked hard at getting those animals home before they ever get to the shelter. And used to, their, their attitude was, um, well, I'm taking the animal to the shelter so they can come here and have to pay all these fees, and it's a punishment. So, you know, uh, I always ask them, so why can't you give them their animal and hand them a ticket? For some reason, they always had this issue with ticketing face-to-face. -face. I don't know. But anyway, so they have worked really hard, and they've been uh, a good partner in the last couple of years of trying to do that. Um, microchips, um, we encourage microchips. All the animals that go out, even owner surrenders, are chipped before they go out. Um, we have started making owner surrender appointments uh, when possible, um, and we do some owner assistance, um, and I'll go to in, into more detail on each of these. Um, adoptions are a huge thing for us. Marketing uh, is huge. Pictures and return to owners, and then the rescues out to transfer. So spay neuter, um, we we do about 500 TNR cats from the public a year. Um, the county actually funds that. Um, I have gotten grants in the past from PetSmart to do more, and we've done up to like 3,000 in a couple of years. Um, we still if they, and we actually even do, we, it didn't matter to me whether they're owned or not owned, but I have a grant now from Petco that we do owned cats, and we do those at the shelter. And then uh, we also do owned dogs, and we do those uh, through some partner veterinarians uh, practices and Emancipet uh, and uh, other clinics that are in the community because our surgery suite is about the size of this table. <laughs> And dogs are just, they're, you know, we have to keep them in crates out in the hallway, and it just gets too noisy, and it's uh, just too much. Uh, we do do our own spay neuters at our shelter. Uh, all the animals are spayed or neutered before they leave, unless there's some extenuating circumstance. Um, we used to let them go home and tell them to bring them back on the day that we do them, and sometimes they wouldn't show up. Um, if we truly trust the person that is adopting them, we've spent a lot of time with them, and we feel sure that occasionally we let them go home, but most of our animals, as soon as they're off stray hold, are neutered right then and there. We don't ever wait until they're just adopted unless they happen to come off stray hold in between the times that we have surgery. And then sometimes they're adopted, and, but late, the last year or two, we've really kept them there, and, and they pick them up on the day of surgery. So we do, um, we contract with veterinarians to do our surgery, um, so they come in, uh, and they're spay-neuter vets, so they're very quick and efficient. We do about anywhere from 35 to 50 animals a day in about five to six hours. Um, and so we uh, just pay the vets to do that, and we provide all of the drugs, and the, we have a surgical tech, and um, so they get it done. So our cost to spay-neuter an animal is actually around $32 an animal. So we've, we've uh, got that down pretty well. Um, I think I've already covered all of that. Uh, TNR, we don't do it ourselves, but we support uh, our local TNR groups. We have about four or five that are really active in the community. We offer the free spay-neuters for uh, the cats that come in. 
um, and the cats get the spay neuter, the ear tip, and the rabies shot. Um, if a person, we have a lot of individuals that just bring the cats in that are stray, and um, they uh, can pay for the FDRCP, and they can pay for the feline leukemia test if they would like it. They're pretty low cost, so it's up to them. They can also pay for a microchip if they want it. Well, actually, now we offer microchips for free, so it doesn't matter. Um, and then our bar barn cat program uh, is very successful. We always uh, get them out of there. Sometimes we have a waiting list for them. Um, and it's amazing, when I first started working there, we, we got in so many feral cats all the time. And we get, I would say, probably a, a quarter of what we used to get in feral cats. So whether it's due to our TNR uh, efforts uh, or the cats is due to weather changes, I don't know, but uh, we're very happy about that. Um, and this actually is one of our feral cats. We have a feral cat colony behind our shelter. Our shelter's on county property and it's uh, still pretty vacant. Um, so we have our own feral cat colony of about maybe 10 to 15 cats. Um, they kind of love the drainage system around there, so we, they pop up. If you go up there at night, you'll see them all hanging out. During the day, you don't see very many. And our first two original feral cats are now our big shelter buddies. They hang out in the cat sally port, and they don't ever leave. And um, people have even tried to adopt them. We're like, yeah, no. <laughs> so return to owners, it starts with animal control. Uh, so we, we, we're really big, again, like I said, on trying to get animal control to get them home before they uh, ever bring them to the shelter. Animal control, all the agencies carry scanners. Um, when they come to the shelter, they're scanning our intake room uh, if they're brought in by a person, and then they're scanned when they're, uh, they get their uh, medical workup. As soon as every animal comes in, they get a workup through the techs, and so they're scanned again. Um, they're scanned at surgery if they uh, make it there long enough to get neutered. So we scan multiple times uh, to try to find. And if somebody brings in uh, a dog or cat that they say is theirs and their owner's surrendering it, it has a microchip, we still follow up on that. Um, and, and it's amazing because a lot of times it actually goes back to an original owner who rehomed it, and now they, they're like, oh, no, I'll come get it. And that happens pretty often. So always follow up on mic microchips. Um, we uh, started a lost and found form on our website. Um, we used to not post our uh, incoming uh, stray animals on our website, but um, after an experience I personally had with my roommate's dog, he disappeared, and um, of course I worked at the shelter so I could check the shelter all the time, um, and I live around Georgetown, around the Georgetown area, so pretty far from Austin. But I also checked Austin Animal Center's website every day. It's Town Lake back then, but uh, every day I checked their website, morning and afternoon, for my uh, roommate. And um, about a week and a half into it, um, a yellow lab pops up on Austin Animal's site, and I was like, oh my God, I think that's, um, I haven't forgot his name now, but, um, and so I called my roommate who was in College Station, and she made it there in time, and it was him. And so what happened was somebody stole them. Um, we have hunters that live back behind, or hunt back behind our house. It was during deer season. He was a beautiful English full-blooded lab, and somebody stole him, I'm sure. And so he ended up, somebody found him walking down t uh, on east, in East Austin down 183. So yeah, there's no way he would have gotten there uh, by us. So I know he was stolen. Plus he had a rope tied around his neck that he had chewed through which he is an escape artist from heck. But, um, but so I, I figured out, okay, that website helped because there's no way I could have gone to town like every day and looked. And so from that point on, originally we started, we had to do it uh, by hand. Uh, one of our staff members would uh, cut and paste all the information onto our website. But now our software, we've talked, and our software's pet point, by the way, we've talked to them and now they automatically put our loss and strays on our, web, on our website for us. So, um, Anyway, that's, that helps a lot because people can just look on there instead of having to make the trip, even though we encourage them to make the trip. But, um, and then, uh, of course, our volunteers are, um, we have actually volunteers that this is their passion is to find lost pets. So they've started Facebook pages for each of the cities, and they post animals that are lost and try to help find uh, matches. They do all the legwork for the person. They'll, like, scan Craigslist 
and they'll look at our shelter. They all have access to Pet Point, and so they'll like get animals home like crazy. So ha having a volunteer that's really passionate about that is awesome. And then um, if somebody can't afford to pick up their animal because it's very expensive to pick up their animal, which I've tried to get those fees reduced and they just think that's not right, but we, we do um, reduced fees or community service. So basically if somebody can't afford to pay, they can, do, they can come in and work 10 hours, um, I mean uh, one hour for $10. So whatever the fee is, they can work it off. And uh, we give them their animal back right then. I don't want their animal. So they can have it back right then. And if they show up, awesome, we have an extra worker. And if they don't, well, too bad they got their animal. So, so owner surrenders, everybody hates owner surrenders, right? So I always have to remind myself that owner surrenders are probably the most responsible of all owners because at least they didn't dump them on the side of the road like 75% of the other animals that come into our shelter that are picked up on the side of the road and never come looking for. So I always try to remind myself that it doesn't make me get any less upset, especially when it's like I just don't have time for it and they just dump them on you. But we do try to do it by appointment now, it, um, and it does help. Um, when we, we, if people show up at the shelter, we'll say we take them by appointment and they're like, well, we're moving tomorrow and I can't have it, so we take them. Um, we don't ever just turn them away if we think at all that animal is going to be uh, dumped on the side of the road. So we get most of them in still as walk-ins. But the ones that we do make appointments for, we make them a week in advance, uh, usually no longer, and we give them suggestions on how to rehome themselves. We actually have the suggestions on our website. And so they're not just holding the animal for a week, they're actually trying to find it at home. And, I, and from, according to staff, it's about half of them call and say, I found it at home, I need to cancel my appointment. So uh, the one thing that we eventually want to do is follow up with people, but we just don't have a staff right now to do that and haven't found a volunteer to do that. But um, we do have fees for owner surrender, it's $25 to owner surrender an animal, again, if they can't afford it. We take it, we try to get them to do the community service thing for it. If it's an animal that it requires a lot of medical attention or um, it's you know 10 years and over, we charge them $60, which is basically our owner surrender euthanasia fee. And we just tell them it's because we're gonna have to put a lot more time and effort and care into taking care of this animal and finding it a new home and you know they should pay for that. So um, most of them pay it. Some of them don't, and they don't ever show up for community service, but that's okay. We still have their animal, and it's going to be safe. Um, Self-rehoming help, we work on that a lot, trying to get them to use Facebook or uh, other methods to rehome. We do caution people when we say, if you're going to post it on Craigslist, be sure and meet in a public place and you know, follow up with references and that kind of thing. And, um, and so what we've just started doing is we uh, formed a 501c3 called Fans of the Williamson County Regional Animal Shelter. And our primary mission for that is to provide assistance to those people who really want to keep their pets, but they just can't afford to keep their pets. As a county agency, we can't pay for something for a private person. Like we can't pay a vet bill for a private person. And what I always did before, if somebody really I knew they loved this dog or cat and they just couldn't afford a medical bill. I would have them surrender it to us. I would pay for the vet visit and have them foster it through that. And then when the animal was well, I would let them adopt it back. <laughs> um, so now we have this uh, other group that we raise funds for and we can pay pet deposits. Um, if they can't afford it, we always ask that they pay half and we'll pay half. Um, we can pay for medicals when they can't afford it, and we can help them with behavior and training. Um, if they can't afford it, we'll send them to get some training. So um, I hope, hopefully that will decrease our intake even further. So adoptions are, are big. That's how we get uh, home. I mean, that's how animals get out of our shelter is through adoptions. So last year in 2014, um, we adopted out almost 68% of the cats that came in and uh, almost 59% of the dogs that came in. So we have a pretty robust adoption uh, program. So you always want to celebrate your adoptions. How many of you have Facebook pages for your shelter? 
We live and die by our Facebook page, seriously. Um, people love good stories, and we try to keep our Facebook page totally positive all the time. Very seldom do we, um, like, put out a plea going, we're going to kill 20 animals. If we put out that plea, that means we're pretty dang close to it, and it's very serious. We might do that once a year. Um, but uh, most of the time, it's happy things. We usually try to post a stray of the day, which a lot of times gets them home. We try to post an adoption story. When people send them to us, they send us pictures and the story. We ask if we can put it on Facebook. They say yes, so we'll uh, put that story on Facebook. Um, but celebrate your adoptions. They're exciting. I used to try to get my staff to ring a bell every time there was an adoption and yell and all that. Yeah. They wouldn't do that. We do adoption promotions. Our regular adoption fee is $75, and that includes the spay neuter, the vaccinations, the rabies, um, a well check by a, one of the vets um, that participate, um, microchip, um, and now we're going to be providing collars, tags, and uh, leashes as well. So that includes all of that. However, I don't think I've charged $75 for an adoption in the last three years. <laughs> so I always have an adoption promotion, always. Um, our best adoption promotions actually are uh, name your price or by donation. Um, people will hand us a $500 check sometimes for an animal. So usually those, because, yeah, you're going to have those that adopt it for a dollar, but you're also going to have the ones that will do 100 bucks, and you don't have to ask for it. You just, they just do it, and those, they like that. Um, we do spin the wheel sometimes, like we'll have uh, little things in there and they'll spin the wheel for it or they'll pick out of a bucket and it'll say your adoption fee is $20 or whatever. But we do, um, if you give us a holiday, we could probably give you a special. So I think that was our Christmas and our Thanksgiving, uh, our fall special. And so we also do happy birthday specials. So anytime a staff member has a birthday, they get to pick the special of the day. And so the staff member gets celebrated, and it's a special for the day. So that's our um, happy birthday specials. We, uh, we do them for cats, too. And really, if any of you ever want ideas for promotion, you're welcome to steal our ideas. I mean, sometimes when I need an idea, I'll, like, Google something on thing, I'll just say like a Valentine's special for shelters or for animals, and you'll come up with all kinds of stuff. So, and we, nobody ever cares if you steal it, so. Um, pictures are extremely important. Um, we take an intake picture on every animal that comes in, and they look like those right over there. Um, and those aren't very adoptable animal looking pictures, right? So we also have three actually uh, volunteer photographers that come in and they redo all of our pictures. So all of our pictures are usually nice. Um, and so these are some of the dogs that have uh, updated better pictures. And our cats. And they get to put their watermark on it so you know which, who does it. So they get things. So that's, uh, I think his name was Benzie, but you can see his intake picture. That, that automatically goes up on our website and in the file, and then they're replaced with better pictures as they get around to taking them. And usually the photographer's are there mm, three to four days a week to keep it up to date. And our kitty cats, I always say we have the, uh, we, we, our cats, they usually hold them like this, and their eyes are like this. <laughs> are there in the back of the kennel or in their litter box. So we also do videos, and I have to, I'm sorry, I have to do this here. Okay, transfers. I wish I could say we had a huge rescue group that comes and pulls from us like APA, but we don't. <laughs> so uh, it's a struggle for us to get animals into rescue, and it's kind of a catch-22, because when you say you're not going to kill them, and you don't make a euthanasia list, they're like, well, you don't need our help, we're going to go help other animals in other shelters. And so uh, that hurts us a lot, but I still refuse to say I'm going to kill dogs just to get them out of there. I mean, they, you can only cry wolf so many times. Um, so only about 12% of our dogs go into uh, rescue and 21% of the cats. And generally our rescues are uh, full breed rescues. 
Um, so uh, I will say that um, for a because APA is pretty close to us, they take all of our sharks and little sharks, not big sharks, <laughs> our little sharks, you know, little bitey dogs, and they take uh, all of our parvo uh, puppies or uh, dogs that we get in. So um, they help us in that respect. They are very limited in what they can take um, outside their contract of Austin as far as big dogs. And, you know, obviously that's always the shelter's biggest need is the big dogs. Um, we have a, a pretty much one cat rescue that comes and pulls cats from us. Um, and so she pulls a lot um, and then adopts them out in pet smarts around South Austin. Um, So volunteers, boy, you could not operate a shelter without volunteers. I just heard somebody tell me earlier that uh, the shelter wouldn't even let the volunteers in there. Our volunteers, most of, most of them have, a lot of them have pet point access so they can look up animals. Um, that we do have different levels of volunteers. We have about three to 400 that go through orientation a year. And uh, I don't know if any of you were just in the a volunteer uh, talk that she had uh, from APA, but um, the same thing. Some of them, you know, never make it to the shelter past the orientation for whatever reason. Um, some of them work one or two times and it's like, yeah, this is not for me. But we have some really dedicated, dedicated volunteers that some of them are there almost every day. Um, they do various things. We have people that volunteer from home, like they'll keep up our pet finder page. Um, and they do all that from home, so they don't even have to actually come to the shelter sometimes. So uh, volunteers are uh, the backbone of our shelter. Um, so we do have different levels, um, and after 10 hours, and after 10 hours of volunteering, they get a T-shirt, and they get to promote up to different levels. Level two is they learn about customer service, and they learn about the different areas uh, of the shelter, and. Uh, like intake and uh, just different things. Um, and then we also have our sit team, which is fairly new. It's this year because um, our long-term dogs, which we call long-term lovables, um, they need extra, I mean, obviously they're long-term because they have some kind of issue that people don't want to adopt them, right? So we have a sit team now that works on those, and there's probably 12 to 13 on that team. Um, and then uh, each volunteer goes through an application and a background check before they can volunteer. Um, I think probably this is one area that we could do better. Um, we have one person, which is our community marketing, uh, our community programs person that does uh, the volunteer, um, the fostering, she also does marketing, and all the fundraisers. <laughs> so she has her hands full. And prior to her, a couple of years ago, coming on board, prior to that position, uh, myself and uh, my admin supervisor used to kind of uh, share the duties that she does now. So um, that, if you ever get, a, if you get a position in your shelter, that is one of the most important positions: uh, is marketing, fundraising, and somebody to deal with the volunteers and the fosters. She, uh, we're still trying to find a volunteer coordinator to help her to, to do some of that, but I think the follow-up and that kind of thing uh, lacks sometimes. But we're working on it. We do try to say we really appreciate you. This sign actually is on the wall of our shelter uh, outside, and we have a big thank you sign in our flower bed as you leave the shelter for coming, whether you're a volunteer or a customer. Um, so we do try to say thank you, and sometimes we're not always great at it, but we, we try to work at that. Um, we obviously have cats and dogs, volunteers. They do a variety of different things in our shelter, uh, as I'm sure they do in every shelter. So our SID team um, are level four volunteers. That means they've been there for a while um, and that they've gone through the other stages. Um, they have their own Facebook page that they communicate with each other on. They have 10 dogs at any one time that they work with. That's what they work with until, that, until one of them get adopted. They put another one on there. And there's a notebook for communication, and they all train together, so their training techniques are all consistent. Um, and then they, like, um, they'll come up different days of the week. So each, each day of the week, I usually have a sit team there, and they work with those 10 dogs. And sometimes they have time, and they work with other dogs, too. But uh, that has worked really well with our long-term dogs. And um, actually, they're going, they each have a dog now, and they're going through uh, CGC. Canine Good Citizen class with their dogs. 
Fosters, can't even tell you how important fosters are. We put a lot of animals in fosters, uh, and the reasons for fosters are too young, too old. We do retirement fosters, so they don't have to adopt out a dog that's 16. They go into a retirement home in a foster home or you know, somebody who doesn't want to take on the expense and will continue to pay their expenses. And we don't, you know, like do blood work every six months and, you know, all kinds of workups and all that. We do basic care and keep the animal comfortable uh, until it's time to go. Hospice fosters for like dogs with cancer or cats with cancer or um, renal failure until it's their quality of life is no good any longer. Um, medical fosters, um, we we probably get in, gosh, I would, I would guess two to three hit by cars a week that have to have uh, legs pinned or amputated or whatever, bed rest for six weeks for uh, uh, pelvic fractures. So those all go into foster behavior, fosters, which are a little bit harder to find. Um, and then we foster for space. When we get uh, really over full, we'll put out uh, and we'll do like a weekend foster or uh, we do cold weather fosters because we have 14 kennels that are outside. And so in, in a couple of days, it's going to be freezing again, and so we will put out uh, a cold weather foster, and they'll keep them for that period of cold weather uh, in their homes. And that has been very successful when you have a, a very finite time limit. I just need you to take a dog for four days, and they're all about that. Um, and then holiday fosters, obviously. So last year, uh, we had uh, 1,800 dogs and cats go into foster, and we had 530 foster homes. And do we lose some of them through that? Yes, we do. <laughs> but hopefully they're, you know, they stay in that foster home and we just lose contact. So, and then those are some of the dogs that have gone into foster. And obviously cats and dogs. We even had... Our sisters foster. <laughs> they actually found those kitties, and they, man, they were, they were great fosters. They fostered them through a lot. And this is my marketing person, Misty. She does all of the marketing and volunteers. She's my court, uh, commu uh, pub, what is it, community coordinators person. Uh, she does Facebook, social media. Um, we use local publications, which we have a county paper, um, which. And we have, excuse me, a couple other publications. And then she has a lot of contacts with medias that she's developed over the last couple of years. So anytime we have a story of interest, she just has to call one of our contacts and they're right on it. So those are extremely important to get if you want good publicity. And it's really hard for like us more per se because we're right next to Austin and Austin's very uh, prominent and they get a lot of publicity and so it's hard for us to sneak in there every once in a while but with those contacts now it makes it a lot easier so work on your contacts and especially give them good stories so when something bad happens and it will they have all the good stuff too to fall back on and they're not quite as tough on you if something bad happens so one of my favorite things <laughs> So obstacles in a shelter. Yes, there's a lot of obstacles. Lack of space is the biggest one. Our shelter was built brand new, and it was built 50-some-odd kennels too short for the intake that they took. From day one, our shelter was full. It was actually built with 52 kennels, and it needed about 120 for the intake that we take, uh, take in. So we get very creative with space. Um, injured animals are always uh, an obstacle. Budget. Nobody ever, everybody has all the money they ever need, right? Long-term stays, kitten season, and, uh, you know, big seizures uh, for, like, courting and stuff. So lack of space. Um, basically, I can tell you is we're just creative. We pair up all of the dogs that we can pair up. Every one of our adoption kennels, uh, when we are full, are paired up. Um, and then the ones that uh, don't get along with other dogs stay back in our stray hold, and we just have to take people back through that area. But um, we pair up whatever gets along with other dogs, they get paired up. Um, the only time we separate them is, well, we separate them the first night or two nights that they're together, so there's nothing that happens in the middle of the night, and we separate them at feeding time. So our feeding time is in the morning before we clean, and so it, they go through and shut all the guillotine doors, feed each dog on each side, and then, of course, when they clean, they move them to one side and then move them back to the other side. 
Um, do what you have to do temporarily. I've gotten busted by the state several times, but I would still rather keep a dog in a crate than kill it. And I'm guessing that if I asked that dog, would you rather stay in a crate for two days or get the blue juice, he'd probably pick the crate over the blue juice any day. Um, state doesn't like that. We're working on other options like we just ordered um, like $30,000 worth of stainless steel cages, to, you know, the temporary roll around cages to keep them in instead of the wire crates. Um, every day, pretty much every space is full in our shelter, but we don't anticipate uh, we don't empty cages to anticipate seizures or anything like that. Last Monday we got in 20 dogs from a hoarding case. And um, so we just have to hustle and, you know, we put out pleas to the community and almost every time the community comes through. So we just have to, you just have to be resourceful. And don't panic. Medical, um, we get a lot of broken bones. We actually have an orthopedist. Um, veterinarian now that he's a roaming veterinarian and he comes to our shelter and does our orthopedics uh, for us. He does all the pinning and plating and amputations and things like that. Very reasonable price. We can afford him. Um, and so uh, medical issues, most of the shelter illnesses like kennel cough and upper respiratory and cats, things like that we treat um, at the shelter. We have uh, a couple of isolation rooms. Kennel cough we usually treat in place unless they get lethargic. Uh, are, you know, sicker than what they normally get with kennel cough. Um, and where we live, we get a lot of gunshots. So these are just some of our medical cases. Um, the dog on top has lupus, canine lupus, and um, so his half of his nose was missing and part of his eyes and things like that, but he's on the mend. He's in a foster home. Parker is our newest, uh, one of our newest little starv starving dogs, and I was just saying, I just got off the phone with the vet. He's probably going to have to be euthanized because after two months of working with him, he's not getting any better, and he, even though he eats, wags his tail, and plays, he is probably going to go into kidney failure, so poor Parker. And then cats with eyes, lovely, and then Dinah in the middle is my dog. She came in the shelter with a badly broken, dislocated leg, and it was amputated, so she's mine now. She also had behavior issues, which all of my dogs in my house have behavior issues, <laughs> seven of them. And this was one of my fosters, uh, a little kitty with a big, fat tummy, which we always worried that was FIP, but it wasn't. It kept getting bigger, and he kept playing and eating and being fine, and so after a month, I was like, you know... His belly's going to bust if I don't take him to the vet. So I took him to the vet, and he actually had a uh, congenital defect. His ureter to one kidney was not formed, so his kidney filled up with, with urine. So he'd have his kidney removed. So he's fine. He's in a happy home. Not my home. Long-term stays. This is Vinny. Vinny was there for a very long time. Vinny was actually pulled from another part of Texas by a rescue group that's in our location. And then when he had behavior issues in their house and they surrendered them to us because they don't take them back, they wouldn't come get them because he had behavior issues. So we got stuck with Benny, with Vinny. Vinny was a good dog. He, he stayed at our shelter probably, I would guess, nine months, ten months. Um, so he was one of our long-term lovables. Um, we have a list that I make every two weeks updated on, on the dogs that have been there 30 to 60 days, 60 to 180, and then like whatever uh, above. So I update that for cats and dogs every two weeks and send it out so everybody knows which dogs and cats have been there the longest. Um, then our sit team, uh, and we market the heck out of our long-term dogs and cats, and we always, all of our dogs and cats get enrichment all the time. Um, and then they are taken out and walked. And this is Vinny now. He got adopted a few weeks ago, and he is so happy. People have actually seen him out walking with his family, um, and uh, they took him by PetSmart and, and showed the adopters, I mean, the, uh, my uh, staff there, him, so we're super happy. I actually think that there's a home for every cat and dog. We just have to be able to hold them long enough to find that home. Our enrichment, we have big play yards in the back. Um, we, um, we used to do play groups, but uh, lost a person that did that, and so um, we're working on regaining that ability, but, we, but the dogs get to go out there and play in pools and um, 
you know, they just go out in pairs or by one or two. And then our cats have, you know, play area that they can play in, um, especially when they're cleaning, they get let out and able to play. And these are our cats in adoption, so they're healthy. People always say when you have a no-kill shelter that your length of stay um, is, you know, you hoard dogs and you keep them forever and cats. And so this is our length of stay, our average length of stay. And obviously we have, you know, probably 30 dogs and cats that are there for a year or less. Um, but we also have dogs and cats that are there for a day. So these are, this is our actual length of stays for dogs and cats averaged for the year. Uh, yes, it's days. So kitten season, yay, it's only a month away. <laughs> um, April to October is really our big, uh, sometimes one year it started early like in March, but most of the time ours starts around mid-April and you start seeing the numbers go from about 100 intake to 350 to 400 intake a month. Um, everybody goes through it, moms and kittens, bottle babies and gruel babies. I tried doing a bottle baby program like APAs, um, just couldn't find the fosters, to, I mean the uh, volunteers to dedicate themselves to that time, so we backed off of that. And we basically get uh, all of our kittens that are too uh, young to be in the shelter, too young. We, we uh, neuter at eight weeks, so they have to be eight weeks before they come into the shelter. And so we basically, as they come in, we put out police or fosters. and. Last year we were very lucky. We, we kept very few kittens in our shelter. We have, uh, in our shelter it was designed uh, to be pretty and not functional, basically. <laughs> and so uh, we, didn't have a, we didn't have a separate area for kittens. So our, uh, one of our hallways is our kitten hallway where we can separate our kittens from our cats. We had no ISO, so I changed two storage units in the Sally Ports, two storage rooms into our ISO rooms. Uh, two for cats and two for dogs. So, I mean, you have to do what you have to do because that's what you're given. And um, hopefully in the future, our expansion is going to happen and uh, we will have better function. But uh, we just try to get them out. You know, we, uh, moms and kittens uh, go out to foster together. Kittens that are too young that come in. We have a group of uh, bottle baby fosters that love to do that. God bless them. Um, and then budget. Our budget is supported by tax dollars. Um, so, uh, everything goes through our board and then is approved by the county. It's never enough. We never can have enough money, so we have to be very creative. So basically when the board tells me I can't do something or they're not going to fund it, I find another way to fund it. And so um, we have donation, uh, a donation fund, and in that fund we have our medical funds. So no animal that goes to an outside vet is paid through tax dollars, all paid through by donations, every single animal. Every single surgery, every, everything is from outside vets is paid for through that fund. We have a fund for our play yards because we, they wouldn't build us play yards, so we have a play yard fund, and um, it's around $100,000 to, to build our play yards, and so we, we do it in phases, about $25,000 a year. And uh, we're doing the concrete uh, soon, so uh, for our sidewalks and things. But it also includes like a memorial garden and things like that, so. Um, we have, do have our play yards up, which they're 150 feet long and 50 feet wide, and there's two of them. Um, our heartworm treatment, we don't do heartworm treatment at the shelter. However, we pay for heartworm treatment once that dog is adopted. So they go to Austin Animal Trustees. Austin Animal Trustees sends us the bill. Um, and we send home the doctor with the, docs, the 30 days of doxycycline that they need. Um, and so all of that's paid. Coranda beds uh, are paid through our donation, and then we have a big wish, wish list uh, on our website that people can donate items uh, off that wish list to us. Um, our volunteers obviously supplement our staff. Not a whole bunch of them clean per se, but if we do get in a bind where we are short staffed, then they will come in and we have a few that will come in and clean. But they do everything else like walking the dogs and playing with them and helping to socialize the cats and uh, we have volunteers that work in surgery. We have one that uh, does all the preps for surgery, and we have one that does all the packs for surgery. Um, and so we usually, people just find a niche, what they want to do, um, and we put them, that's where we put them. Um, if we have any special projects, it's always, uh, we always uh, get volunteers to do it. We never have enough staff to do special things. 
Um, and then we do fundraisers. We do like three big fundraisers a year. We have a fur ball, um, which is a, you know, a sit down dinner and a uh, silent auction. It used to be a band, but nobody ever stayed for the band, so we quit that. It's dress kind of dressy thing and uh, has a silent auction. And so that raises money for our uh, play yards. And so we raise about ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 a year for that, through that. And then we have our Wolf Walk and Run, um, which is next month, and that's a 5K, and it raises about uh, ten to 15000 for our uh, medical fund. So we have some fundraisers that are dedicated to specific things. And this is just an example of, or this is my budget, but uh, I just want to show you, uh, in 2007, we only collected about $18,000 worth in donations, and now we're collecting about 135000 in donations. And when we first started, we had no volunteers, maybe two or three. And I will say our shelter started off in a very rocky way. Um, they did not staff it like it should be staffed because they thought if you build it, the volunteers will come and they'll do everything. So they only hired five people to run our entire shelter when it started. And the shelter was in the news about once a week. Um, they got cruelty charges filed against them. There was all kinds of lovely things that happened, um, basically just because they didn't have enough people to take care of it. But when you, when you start having successes and you say, we're no kill, we don't kill, we, you know, we, we strive. And we have a very pat line that we use, like we are an open admission shelter. We do our best not to euthanize any animals, but it always depends on the community and their support. So it puts it back onto the community too. But uh, we get a lot of support through the community in fosters, volunteers, and donations. So we celebrate our success on Facebook every month. We publish our save rate um, by a cute picture. That's Chuck. Chuck's our long, one of our long-term lovables. Um, we put pictures up of uh, great adoptions. That's Jefferson's Foster with the lupus. So, and the other thing is print good stories. You know, this dog came in looking skinny and beat up and and that's him after some care in a family, and that's the letter he wrote to us um, saying how much he appreciated that. And I know you probably can't read that because if I was sitting out there, I couldn't read it. Um, but so the other thing is, is this is a, a hard business to be in. After 32 years of being a paramedic and an ER nurse, I saw a lot of stuff. But I can tell you by far, this is way harder than that because these animals depend on us and sometimes we fail them. And so it's very, very important to take your vacation days, um, use spa days, have a hobby outside of this. Um, you have to find a balance between what you do and your other life. And if you don't have that, you're not gonna be in this very long. Talk to someone that's been there, that's done that. When I was in EMS, we had a support group that, for critical incidents, and we would go around and we would, uh, when there was a critical incident in a department, we would go as peers and sit down and talk with them because, or let them talk, basically, because we knew. And so talk to a peer. They know what you're going through. Talk to them. And uh, Facebook can be your best friend or your nemesis because you start friending all these people that are in animal rescue and then you start seeing over and over and over. And uh, I, I really try to limit my personal Facebook page to me, and, um, but I still have a lot of friends that are now. So I'll scroll through and I'll see animals, but I really do scroll through. And it's really hard not to get wrapped up in, oh my God, that dog up there, I want that dog, I think I can save it and try to pull it in. You have to concentrate on uh, an area and you have to really uh, you know, make that your priority because it's very easy to get sucked in and then you start feeling hopeless because you can't save them all. Um, but really, uh, take care of yourselves. For me, it's the beach. Uh, that's what I do. But at, at any given moment, you have the power to say, this is not how the story is going to end for any animal. You have that power. Everybody has that power. And there are two primary choices in life, to accept conditions as they exist or accept the responsibility for changing them. So the animals need us to fight for them. And with that, I will take any questions. <laughs>